My name is Martin Hertzfeld. I'd like to first thank the European Energy Center for this course today in photovoltaics in the United States. The opinions here are my opinions, and I'm not particularly endorsing one product or another. And if there are any decisions made after taking this course, they would be indeed your decisions. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Again, this course is an overall introduction to solar photovoltaics in the United States. After teaching for a number of training centers in the United States, the technologies which have been prevalent have been primarily flat plate solar collectors, which would be monocrystalline or polycrystalline modules. Not so much solar thermal has been in much demand, nor has concentrating photovoltaics. But let me tell you a little bit more about myself. Again, I'm Martin Hertzfeld. I'm an IREC or Interstate Renewable Energy Council certified master trainer for the PV installation professional. I'm one of the few certified master trainers, which is the highest level of certification that IREC provides here in California. I'm also a California licensed solar contractor. I hold classifications in C46, trenching D56, which would be, for example, ground mounted systems, pole installation and maintenance, solar on poles, and also instrumentation in low voltage systems, which would be, for example, monitoring systems and IT systems, which have to do with solar energy systems. I'm also a Underwriters Laboratory UL certified PV installer. I'm also one of the few UL certified PV installers in California. I have been a licensed solar contractor since 2006 and a licensed contractor since 2004. I'm also a subject matter expert as well with contracts with the jurisdiction. So I'm qualified as a subject matter expert and serve as a subject matter expert to a number of companies and organizations. My company primarily focuses in on both the roof and ground mounted systems. I'm a licensed qualifier in addition to being a journeyman. I also am an OSHA authorized construction trainer by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration and I hold a certificate in OSHA 30. So I'm able and authorized to issue upon successful completion of the course both OSHA 10 and OSHA or OSHA for the entry level or OSHA 30 for the supervisory level for the courses which I teach here in the States. I also have a degree in management which is for business and I'm a project consultant and contract technical inspector for various inspections with uh, a company. So again I'd like to thank the European Energy Center for again having this a course in solar photovoltaics. So let's take a look at what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about PV technology in the United States. We're going to look at the relevant regulations, policies, and legislation on the federal and the state level in the United States. These predominant technologies we're going to look at on both the inverter and on the module. Inverter technologies may be, for instance, string inverters or microinverters. And module te technology, we pretty much talked about briefly here, which would be either monocrystalline or polycrystalline systems. And we're going to look at some of the particular instances and cases where we might be using both of those kinds of technologies. We'll also talk about environmental factors, such as the geography and the level of in infrastructure. And we're going to place our emphasis primarily on utility interactive or grid tied systems because those are the systems that have been most prevalent. Energy storage systems are becoming more popular in but the systems which are being installed are primarily grid tied or utility inter interactive systems. We're also going to talk a little bit about the economic situation it has to do with growth, labor and investment and one of the situations which has ha happened here in the United States is that a lot of the investment in the past had been for research and development. And in my opinion, more investment, which is, which is now becoming so before 2016, 
is in for production. So more of an emphasis on production, less of an emphasis on research and development, and also installing proven reliable technologies, which the installer actually is familiar with, in order to install and present in front of their customers. If we look back a bit, 20 years ago, we're looking at a paper which was uh, presented here at the conference in Washington, D.C. in around 1996. This paper actually had great projections for where the markets are today. These markets would be niche markets in grid-connected photovoltaic systems and, in other words, customer-sided photovoltaic systems, distributed generation systems. And so there are a number of incentives, if we look a little closely at this paper, which would encourage the growth of solar in these specific markets. Well, some of the markets, which may um, also take advantage of these incentives, would be tax credits. So there's an incentive tax credit, which is due to expire now in 2016 and become lower. There's also net metering. Net metering is the capability, for instance, if I were to grow some oranges out on a tree and then take those oranges and present those oranges to a retail store or grocery outlet, I would receive full credit, retail credit, for the price of those oranges. So net metering has also been an incentive here in the United States with solar as well. So if we take a look at the individual markets, we can look at the markets which have actually were projected to continue to grow. And those markets are today, California specifically, and Hawaii. California by far has the largest number of solar installations as well, including more than 1,100 solar contractors specifically for the, the trade. California has a specialty classification for solar and including New York and the East Coast uh, as far as additional installations and encouragement and incentives for solar. So if we're looking at what the projections were of the top five niche markets, we see that the top niche markets were pro approximately $4 a watt was the cutoff. So anything over $4 a watt was an incentive in, in to install solar. So today, the installation fully system install is approximately $4 per watt. And the emergency, emerging markets are markets between $3 and $4 a watt. That is as of today. So uh, uh, the average system size is approximately 4 to 5 kilowatts. So between 4 and 5 kilowatts would be a system at approximately $16,000 for that system. So if we look at the areas, it was California, Arizona, and Hawaii, which has grown. Hawaii has experienced a tremendous growth in solar technology and also now is dealing with issues such as curtailment, reactive power, and other kinds of issues in order to manage the number and demand of installations in Hawaii. As a solar contractor, I also consult with other states. So in Arizona, for instance, there is a system that is being considered for a ground-mounted system. So uh, working with the customer in order to help them try to understand since most people are installing solar energy systems for the very first time. In California, I'm licensed to work in California. However, just to note, a lot of the larger solar companies are looking and placing emphasis on, on roof mount systems as opposed to ground mount systems. So many of the smaller installers are installing ground mount systems, which tend to also be larger systems as well, also for agriculture and other rural communities. So if we look at some of the other markets as well, uh, the emerging markets, you can look here at some of the emerging markets based on this price point for power. Again, excellent report which outlined the potential and niche markets for solar, which again appears to hold true today. Again, talking about Hawaii, again, there is an issue in, in, in Hawaii, which is uh, constantly uh, being resolved, which has to do with the, the penetration of solar systems there and being able to manage it. So let's take a look more at these markets. 
and how the number of growing installations has continued to grow over time. So if you look back in year 2000, when I first started to really get into the solar industry, I've had a solar, uh, solar system installed here. I installed uh, my system here in uh, 2004. It's been working great uh, ever since. It's, uh, we're on a time of use rate here as well, and my, so my system is tilt is, uh, has an azimuth uh, to, the, to the southwest, which actually takes into account uh, time of use rates. But if we take a look here, there were only a no, uh, in 2000, there were only approximately 300 systems installed. Then if we look in 2004, there were only approximately 10,000 systems, maybe 11,000 systems installed. But again, you're looking at the areas which solar is growing, again, in the East Coast and in uh, the East Coast, rather, and in also in the West Coast as well. So if we look at the number of solar installations, now we're seeing solar installations at about 82,000. And from there, we're looking in the National Renewable Energies Laboratory Open PV database, we're looking at approximately 420,000 installations at that price of approximately $3.30, $0.38 or so a watt. I'd like to call your attention to this number here. This number here, showing an install capacity of 8, about 8.4 gigawatts. Well, just to bring to your attention, in 2013, there were approximately 5 gigawatts installed. In 2014, there were approximately 6 gigawatts of solar installed. And right now, there are approximately 18 to 20 gigawatts of solar installed in the United States. So this particular number is only for the systems which are actually in the open PV project database. So again, the demand for solar has grown tremendously over the years. Another factor. Another factor would be codes and regulations, specifically the National Electrical Code. The National Electrical Code is specifically a document which is produced by the National Fire Protection Association. There are certain areas in which the code may be may favor certain technologies as far as ease of installation. So for instance, in California, we are still on the 2011 National Electrical Code, but areas such as Massachusetts would be on the 2000 and 14 electrical code as early adopters. There are specific areas such as arc fault detection, which have been changed, which is or been changes in the code, and rapid shutdown, which could impact the technology which is installed on the roof or on the ground, but specifically more on the rooftop as well. So this is a, a was a photo from the National Electric Manufacturers Association showing the adoption of codes in the state. Specifically for California, we are on the 2011 National Electrical Code. So this is a picture here from the 2008, but we're on 2011 today. Typically, in California Electrical Code will accept pretty much everything in the National Electrical Code and then there's a few other areas, such as the medical area, which is actually included in the California Electrical Code. So, as a solar installer, we kind of look at it like this, is that if it appears in the National Electrical Code, then it probably would not be in the White Book. If it's in the White Book, it would not appear primarily in the National Electrical Code. So following the manufacturer's instructions would either be in the manufacturer's instructions or the electrical code. So I'm encouraging you to download a copy of the white book for electrical equipment. And in addition, there is a code correlation database available there at UL website that allow you to find, for code officials, be able to find resolution between the, the, the code and um, the manufacturer's instructions and other electrical equipment. I also like to provide you, uh, take attention and note to the 2015 International Solar Energy Provisions, 
And this is a document which includes the International Code Council documents, and there's a number of documents there, which would be the International Building Code, the International Fire Code, the International Residential Code, and it's combined and talks about those provisions on specifically for photovoltaics. So again, I encourage you through the International Code Council uh, picking up a copy of this document here as well. The states. Some states do solar better than other states. Each of the states are primarily in freeing the grid graded on two areas. The first area would be on net metering. As we briefly mentioned before, net metering would be, for example, you grow some oranges and then you're able to present them to a retailer and get the full retail rate and value for those, for those oranges. In California, we get an A on both net metering and interconnection. So net metering and interconnection, it's, would be, it's a less complicated, involved process than, very, than many other states. For instance, if you were to install a system in California, you may look at a stack of paper work and forms like this. But if you look at other areas in the United States, you may be looking at a larger set of forms. So as a result, this de-incentivizes solar from being installed in other areas in the states. So if we look at some of the other states, we're looking at Texas and South Carolina, it be more difficult to install them, and they receive a particular grade on well, how well and how easy it is to install solar. I would think that solar, specifically electricity, would work everywhere in the United States the same, but again, each individual jurisdiction has their own requirements of what's required in their state in order to approve and permit solar systems. So I encourage you to go ahead and take a look at Freeing the Grid for more information on net metering and interconnection here in the United States. Another location I'd like to make you aware of is the Solar Electric Power Association. The Solar Electric Power Association has a number of statistics on the areas in which solar is growing from a utility scale perspective. From a utility scale perspective, solar is number one in Southern and Northern California and number two in Southern California. So that's the number of systems or customer sided photovoltaic systems which are being installed in California is number one. Although the largest system may be in Tennessee, the number of solar installs, the largest would be in California and for example, Hawaii. So I encourage you to take a look at that document here as well. So let's take a look at an actual installation and some of the items and issues here on an actual installation. This particular one is an installation, an inspected installation, and if you take a look at the top along the ridge, that this area here would be three feet or less by the International Fire Code and other jurisdictional restrictions. So as you look, it may be again three foot or less specifically for residential. So as far as best practice, shown here as best practice, would be a system which is parallel to the roof structure, maybe four or so inches off the roof. And another thing that one looks for are wires or conductors hanging on the roof for underneath the array as well. And then here, back here, you have the point of interconnection, the point of connection, which would be typically a backfed breaker right there uh, in the panel. Another item that which I want to mention here is that since most of the systems are being installed on the rooftop, there's also an emphasis too to install systems on the ground. So you have ground structures and sometimes you can have beautiful ground structures as well uh, for a lot of systems in specifically rural communities. So you not only have the option of the roof, but you can have other kinds of structures here which uh, are using uh, proven 
modules, monocrystalline and polycrystalline technology.